Good morning, everybody. So good to be back with you. Thank you for joining us online and worshiping with us. Uh, Everybody who's listening out there, you are part of our Harvest family online. And uh, I just, I'm so thankful that you are here having church with us, listening to God's word. And I wanna jump right into the message today because I really believe God has given me something for our church and for you and our church family um, that's really important for where we're at. Not just for where we're at today, but really where I think God's trying to take us and some things that we need to know that are coming. And I wanna, I wanna uh, preach today out of Matthew chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, uh, you can open them to Matthew 14. Uh, we've got an uh, outline on the version app. You can go there and get that too. But before I jump into Matthew 14, I wanna set up something that happens in Matthew chapter eight. In order to understand the, the, the importance of Matthew 14, we gotta look back at something that happened in Matthew chapter eight. Now, Matthew chapter eight is a great story of Jesus and the disciples, and, and many of you know this story, of them in the boat going across the lake, and there's a storm that comes. So Jesus and the disciples are in their, their boat. They're trying to get across the lake, and it says literally a violent storm struck the lake comes out of nowhere, blindsides them. They just, they get hit with this. It's so bad, the waves are coming in the boat and it's literally scaring the disciples. They are freaked out and the whole time, Jesus is asleep. I love that picture of Jesus asleep in the boat. The disciples are scared. Now we know they're scared because it says they shouted and they screamed to wake Jesus up and they shouted at him and they said, they said, Lord, save us. We are going to drown. These men who, some of them were fishermen. These men who knew this lake and they had spent years fishing and on the waters and waves and storms. These men were so afraid that they thought they were going to die. And they wake Jesus up, which normally I would think is a good thing. When you feel like you're going to die, when you feel like you're in the middle of a storm, when you feel like something horrible is going to happen, what do you do? Wake Jesus up. Ask Jesus for help. And that's what they do, except Jesus doesn't really respond the way I think that they thought. It says that he rebuked them. He said this in verse 26, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Why do you have such little faith? Before Jesus deals with the storm, waves are still coming in the boat, the wind's still blowing. Before Jesus deals with the storm, he deals with them. And before Jesus can deal with the storms in our life, I think more importantly, Jesus wants to deal with us. And he deals with them. And then he says to the storm, he says, um, He got up, he rebuked the wind and the waves and suddenly everything was calm. Everything was calm. And the disciples in verse 27 of Matthew 8 said that the disciples were amazed. I bet they were. And it says, they said, who is this man that even the wind obeys him? Who is this man? They asked themselves. Jesus in one moment, one word calms everything. That's what Jesus can do in your life. In one moment, in the middle of the chaos, Jesus can calm everything. Imagine this lesson. This is such a great illustrated sermon. I mean, the lessons that the disciples got hands on with Jesus, unbelievable. And this is in Matthew chapter eight. Now we're gonna go six chapters into Matthew 14. I was studying this out this week. And I like to get into the words. I like looking at definitions of word. I'm a little bit of a nerd that way. Greek words, Hebrew words. It just, a lot of times definitions bring light to things that you, know, you just didn't know. And this week, I actually just went back to the Webster's Dictionary. I thought, you know, I just wanna look this up one more time. And I wanna give you the Webster's Dictionary for storm. It's really, I think, paints a picture for what we're gonna talk about today. It says this in the Webster's Dictionary. It is a, storm is a disturbance in the atmosphere marked by wind. A disturbance in the atmosphere marked by wind. To be disturbed or to be in an agitated state, a serious disturbance. A storm is something when your atmosphere gets disturbed. And it says by wind. I was thinking about that. You know, wind is something you don't really see. You don't see wind, but you feel the impact of the wind. You don't see it, but it begins to move things in your life. You don't see it, but it can knock things over. And there is a disturbance, if you haven't noticed, in a lot of our world. 
It's hard to see kind of what the storm is, but there's been a disturbance and things are being, people are being agitated and, and there's stuff happening in our world. And so Jesus in Matthew 8 takes the disciples through this storm and they get to see this amazing thing. Now we're going to jump to Matthew 14 and this has been a very long day for Jesus. Jesus just found out that John the Baptist is dead. Herod killed John the Baptist, beheaded him. And it says Jesus wanted to get away and pray and spend some alone time in a remote area with God. And his disciples and Jesus, they get out to the, this remote area and it says the crowds heard and they came to Jesus. And when he saw them, he had compassion on them. And it says all day long, he ministered to them and he healed the sick. He's performing signs, wonders, miracles. Then they're hungry and Jesus is gonna feed over 5,000 people. This is the miracle of 5,000. He feeds these people with just five loaves and two little fish. What an unbelievable day of miracles, signs, and wonders. And here's where we pick up our story. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, it says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that the disciples get back into the boat. He's forcing them back into the boat, and he wants them to cross over the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Why? Because that's originally what he set out to do. He knew that even after all this, he needs to get alone and he needs to pray. If we would just do that in our lives more, get alone and pray. And it says that night fell while he was there alone praying in verse 24. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble. They're in trouble again. Far away from the land for a strong wind... Here's another storm. A strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. The title of my message today, if you haven't already got it, is when the next storm hits. I really feel like the Lord wants me to ask this question. Are you ready for when the next storm hits? And here they are. The disciples are in another storm they're in another storm, another, another gust of wind has disturbed their environment. And I just feel like God wants us to know this today, that there's always going to be another storm. There's always another disturbance coming. There's always another storm coming. It may not be today, but I promise you this, that there's a storm, there's a disturbance coming. Maybe it'll be in your marriage. Maybe it'll be with your family. Maybe it'll be something in our world that we don't know yet. Maybe it's your finances. I could go on and on down the list, but there are things that are going to be disturbed. And are we ready for when the next storm hits? Now in verse 25, it says about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. I love this. And then when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified in their fear. They cried out, it's a ghost. This is one of the funniest stories to me because here are these grown men again in the middle of the lake, in the middle of a storm, they're freaked out and they actually see Jesus, but they don't recognize him. They say, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. And they're, they're afraid of ghosts and they're terrified. Now, in the middle of that, Jesus calls out to them in the storm. He says to them, don't be afraid. Take courage, I am here. I love these three little phrases. Don't be afraid. The storm is still going on all around them. It's almost like the first time. Before he deals with the storm, He's gonna deal with them. Don't be afraid. Be strong. Take courage. I'm here. God is with you. Jesus is saying, I'm here. I'm with you. In the middle of this storm, I'm with you. But Peter calls out to the Lord, and you can tell Peter doesn't really quite believe this is Jesus or not. He's not sure. And he says, Lord, if it's really you, like, I don't know. Like, who else would be walking on water at three o'clock in the morning on top of the water to come see them? Like, do you know other people that do this? So Peter says, okay, okay, if it's really you, then tell me to come to you walking on the water. You better be careful when you ask Jesus a question. He might just answer it. And that's exactly what happens. Jesus says, okay, come on out. Come on out, big boy. Get out of the boat. Let's go. It's me. Come on out. 
And it says that Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on top of the water towards Jesus. This is unbelievable. Now you've got Jesus walking on water and you've got Peter walking on water. But when he saw the strong wind, which is interesting, again, you don't see wind, you see the effects of the wind. But when he got his eyes off of Jesus and onto the invisible thing that was causing all the disturbance, when he got his eyes on that, it says he was terrified and he began to sink. And, the, and he said, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out, grabbed him, and listen to these words, because it's almost like on repeat from Matthew chapter 8. He said, you have so little faith, why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. And then the disciples worshiped Jesus. They worshiped him. And this is what they said. You really are the son of God. It's amazing. Here we are in the same kind of boat, different storm. Six chapters later, and they're facing another storm. I was thinking in scripture and studying this idea of of storms, there's really, I wrote this down, there's three kind of storms uh, that I think the Bible really kind of shows us. There's probably more than that, but three storms I want you to think about with me today on this message. One is this, there's what I call the storms of destruction. The storms of destruction. This is a storm that the enemy causes in our lives to try to destroy us, to try to hurt us, to try to take us out. This is the storm. When I think of the storms of destruction, I think of Job. Listen, if you, in Job chapter one, it says that, that Satan and God are in the heavenlies having a conversation. And it says this in verse eight of Job chapter one. It says, the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and he stays away from evil. And Satan responds and says, yeah, of course he fears you. And of course he, he's a righteous man because you've got this wall of protection around him. You keep him safe. You've blessed him. He's got money. He's got family. He's got camels. He's got it all. Of course he worships you. Take that away and he will curse you. And so in verse 12, and I hate this verse, in Job chapter one, verse 12, God says, all right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses. He gives him permission to test Job. And in the next several verses, Job is going to lose all his wealth. He's going to lose his family. He's going to literally have his possessions burned up. His wealth is going to be wiped out. His family is going to be attacked. You want to talk about a storm? That's a disturbance all in the same day. It's a storm, a storm of destruction. Job's atmosphere was being disrupted in the worst kind of way. And I want to remind you of what John 10, 10 says, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There is a storm, an attack, if you will, from the enemy to try to disrupt and destroy your life. The enemy is not content to just make you miserable. What he really wants to do is destroy you. And poor Job is sitting there facing a storm of destruction. There's another storm, though, that I see in Scripture, and I call it the storm of correction. The storm of correction. This is where I look at the life of Jonah. Jonah is a prophet, and God tells Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach the message that I give you and tell him to repent. And Jonah's given an assignment, and Jonah doesn't want to obey God. You ever been there? You don't want to do what God tells you to do. You don't feel like doing what he's asked you to do. So Jonah says he goes down to Joppa, the city by the water, the Mediterranean Sea. I've been there. It's a beautiful area. And he gets into a boat and Jonah is going to try to run away from God. It says in Jonah 1 verse 3, Jonah got up and went, to the, went the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He is literally trying to run away from Nineveh and run away from the Lord. And it says he went down to Joppa, found a ship, and he got on it. Verse four, but the Lord 
hurled, I like that, hurled a powerful wind or storm over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Jonah gets an assignment from God. And instead of obeying God, he says, I'm out. And he runs away from God. He goes the opposite direction. He gets on a boat and he tries to leave. And it says, God brought a storm. And the storm was so bad that literally it was starting to break up the boat. This storm, however, is different than the storm of destruction because this storm is not meant to destroy Jonah. It is to correct him to get back on track with what God has asked him to do. The men of this boat are literally going to throw Jonah overboard and the whale is going to come and it's a whole wonderful story that I'm not really preaching on Jonah, but I want you to see that God caused a storm to stop Jonah from running from him. This is a storm of correction. It's not sent by the enemy. It's sent by God to correct Jonah. Proverbs 20 verse 30 says in the Good News Translation, it says, sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. Sometimes it takes correction and pain and sometimes discipline, if you will. Um, And I think this is still the grace of God saying, I'm not gonna let you run away from me. I'm gonna make sure that you get where I need you to be because there's nothing better than being in my will. This This is God. And he sends a storm not to destroy Jonah, but to correct him. It's a storm of correction. Psalms 119 says this in verse 71. Listen to these words. It says, the punishment you gave me was the best thing that could have happened to me. For it taught me to pay attention to your laws and they are more valuable to me than millions in silver or gold. The punishment you gave me was the best thing that could have happened to me. And God's gonna use a storm to help get Jonah back on track where he needed to be. Instead of running away from God, now the storm has got Jonah back on track. It doesn't mean he went willingly and he still had his issues, but there was a storm of correction. And then here's the other storm that I call the storm of perfection. This is the type of storm that I believe the disciples are in here in Matthew 14. Jesus is not trying to destroy them. God is not trying to discipline them. Jesus is trying to develop them and strengthen them. That's what this storm does. When we respond to the storms and the disturbances of life correctly, I think they help build our character and build our faith and help strengthen us and and create endurance for our faith. God, I want to remind you, God is far more interested in your character than your comfort. I don't like storms just as much as the next person doesn't like storms. But sometimes there are things that we can only get in the storms that we can't get in the easiness and the easy times of life. And it says that he, he, sent, that there, he sent the disciples into the boat and now they're in this storm. And so Romans 5 verse 3 says this way, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. Problems, trials, storms, what does it do? It develops us. For we know um, that when our endurance develops, it develops strength of character and our character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. There is something developing in us when we go through trials and tribulation and storms. That's the storm of perfection. James 1 verses two through four says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Why? Why is it that when troubles come and storms come our way, we can shout for joy and we should consider it great joy? Because you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. And we need to let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, listen, you will be perfect. You will be perfect and complete, not lacking anything. This isn't a storm of destruction. This isn't a storm of correction. This is a storm of perfection. There's something that God is trying to do in you and me. Job is going to go through a lot of things. And if you haven't read the story of Job, go home and read it. You're already home, but just read it wherever you're at. (laughs) Job goes through a lot of things. And here's what he says about the storm that he's going through. He realizes this. 
He says in Job uh, chapter 23, verse 10, Job says, when God has tested me, I will come out as pure as gold. Why? Because he understands the storm is only going to perfect me. Like the fire, like the gold going into the refiner's fire, there is something that God is doing and it hurts a little bit to get into the process of this storm and this disturbance. But when he is done, I will be refined like gold. I will be pure. The fiery furnace of gold is not there to destroy the gold. It's there to refine it, strengthen it, to make it more pure. And I think that's what God's desire is for us a lot of times in storms. We run from them. We don't realize that God's trying to develop something in us. In Psalms 92, the interesting little verse, verse 12 of Psalms 92, it says this. It says, the godly will flourish or grow like palm trees. It's an interesting verse. And God has given this to me a couple years ago. And I always find it interesting because it says that the godly will grow. They will flourish like palm trees. Why did the Holy Spirit want us to see this picture of palm trees? Why palm trees? Well, maybe because palm trees grow in rough places in the desert, but I don't think that's it either because cactuses grow in the desert. He doesn't say we're like cactus. He says they're like palm trees. So I did a little study on palm trees, and there's something interesting about palm trees, if you know this, that there's a chemical they have that allows them to stretch. Uh, it's, uh, it's like elasticity in them that basically gives the palm tree this amazing ability to bend without being broken. And when you see these storms that come along the coast and it hits these palm trees. It's amazing. Storms that will blow other palm trees out or other trees out, storms that will take and uproot trees. The palms will bend and they'll move, and, and, but they don't break. Um, there's an amazing storm that hit Galveston, Texas, September 8, 1900, one of the biggest storms to hit. All the people really uh, were warned, but they didn't pay attention to it. They got hit hard. Almost 10,000 people died in this storm, and 75% of the island was destroyed in Galveston, Texas. But one of the things that they found, and it's, it's very interesting, is that they had measured the palm trees before the storm and after the storm. After this hurricane, it was a category four hurricane that hit the island. They noticed that all the palm trees were bent over. They looked messed up. They looked beat up. They weren't the same shape. They weren't, the sa- they weren't standing the same way. But when they measured them, what they'd realized is that in the middle of the storm, they had grown a foot taller. They had literally grown through the storm. They didn't look as good, but they were now taller. They were longer. There was growth in the storm, and the godly will flourish like palm trees. I think this is how God wants us to live. We might go through different storms. We might face different things that we don't like. It's not comfortable Maybe we're afraid. Maybe we're, we're seeing the storm clouds coming and we're going, how are we gonna get through this? And it says that we should be like palm trees. We're gonna bend and we might, we might bend and we might get knocked over, but we don't break. That we stay strong in the Lord. That we continue and we continue in our faith and we fight the good fight of faith and we stay in the word of God. And so it doesn't matter what storm you're in, I, you know, we can still grow and God can use the storm to strengthen us and perfect us. So I was thinking about Job and, and, and what happened and Jonah and these disciples. And here's what I realized, and I want you to see this week, is that I realized in every situation, no matter what, God was still in control. It's kind of a, a harsh reality, but remember, it was God who suggested Job to Satan. He says, have you considered my servant Job? He suggested the tempting and the testing and the disturbance to come. God did that. With Jonah, God caused the storm. It says, and God caused the storm. So here we see God allowed the storm with Job. He caused the storm with Jonah. And it was Jesus who put the disciples in the boat to go into the storm. Every storm, though, God was the one in control. It was the Lord of what he was doing. 
whether it was the enemy tempting Job, whether it was a storm of correction coming to try to get Jonah back on track, or whether it was Jesus sending the disciples straight into the storm because he knew there was something that was going to happen that they would need to face. I want you to know no matter what you go through, whatever storm you're facing, God is in control. And so here the disciples are. They're in a boat again, and they are terrified. It says during the fourth watch of the night, which was 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., they had been struggling and struggling and struggling in another storm. It's a different storm, same pain. Different storm, different process, and yet they're still trying to make it through. They're just doing what Jesus told them to do. A lot of times we think storms come from our disobedience like Jonah. I know I always start to ask myself, what's wrong? Did I do something? But this, they didn't do anything wrong. This, they did exactly what Jesus told them to do. And here they are in the middle of a storm. And I wanna just give you a few quick thoughts on this as we get ready to close on what I believe we need to be ready for in our lives here and what we can get from Matthew 14. I think if there was something that we need to write down and tuck away in our heart as we read this that that just I want to give you that the Lord gave me is this is in the next storm don't forget what you have experienced I wonder if at any point in this night did the disciples say hey guys remember the last storm when Jesus was in the boat with us do you remember what happened remember how in one moment he calmed the waves in the wind I wonder if they remembered the lesson from the last storm, how their fear was rebuked and how faith would be rewarded. I wonder if they remembered that last storm. See, big storms are small issues for those who have faith. Big storms are small issues for those who have faith. And the way you hold on to your faith is you go, hey, remember the last time I was here? Remember what we experienced? Think about the last 24 hours, what they had experienced. They had witnessed Jesus healing the sick. Miracles all day long. 5,000 people were fed with hardly any food. They had witnessed the miracles. They had watched Jesus perform. Power of God had fallen. And now a few hours later, they're in the middle of the night and it says they're terrified again. When the next storm hits, don't forget in the storms of night what God did in the light of day. Don't forget the miracle that just a week ago we were thanking God for because now there's something that we're facing, another disturbance. Remember what you have learned God wants you to remember. God wants you to remember what you have seen. I, I love what one man used to say. Uh, one of my, one, a preacher that I used to listen to, he used to always say, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. When you have experienced God, you have to go back and remember that and remember what God has done. And it's in the middle of the night here. Remember they said, he's a ghost, it's a ghost. I think when your eyes get on the storm, and you forget, it's hard to see Jesus for who he is. They didn't recognize Jesus in the storm because in the middle of the storm, sometimes you forget what Jesus has done. You forget what God has done. You forget, and when you forget, fear begins to take over. Fear and faith cannot live in the same heart for fear always blinds the eyes to the presence of the Lord. They were moved by fear. They didn't even recognize this is Jesus, the one who loves them, the one who walked with them. It's not a ghost, it's Jesus. Why? Because sometimes in the storm, it's hard to remember the Lord. But he spoke to them. When you can't recognize Jesus' face in the storm, great fear will be produced. Don't forget Jesus is in the storm. The same is true that when you can recognize Jesus is in the storm with you, great faith is produced. Look, it's Jesus. He's coming to us. And Sharice, if you'll get ready to come back. They had fear because they had forgotten. They couldn't recognize Jesus. They're struggling. And I think they forgot what Jesus was doing. Remember what Jesus was doing? It said that Jesus had gone up the hill to pray and to spend time with God. He's watching the disciples and he's praying for them. 
He knows what's going on or else why would he walk to them? He knows there's a struggle happening and he's praying. He's not dealing with the storm, but he is praying for them. Romans 8 verse 34, it says that Jesus died for us and it says he raised back to life for us and now Jesus is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. He's praying for us. Do you see the same picture? Jesus up in heaven at the right hand of God praying for you and me. Doesn't mean we're not gonna go through the storm, but don't forget Jesus in the storm. Don't forget that Jesus sees everything, the little storms, the big storms, everything in between. He sees you. He sees the storm. Don't forget what you learned in the last storm. That when you were so afraid and you cried out for help, that he was there. Don't be afraid. Have faith. Jesus says, I am here. He was there with them. I think another thing that God wants us to take home from this passage is that we cannot forget that it was Jesus who told them to get into the boat in the first place. I know I mentioned this already, but sometimes we always go to the fact that, oh, I'm facing something difficult that must be the enemy. You know, it's not always the enemy. Sometimes it's because we're doing exactly what God wanted us to do. They got in the boat and they're going to the other side. Jesus is the one who sent them out into the storm because Jesus is the one who promised to see us through the storm. Jesus did it. There's a purpose for them in this storm. Put your trust, put your trust always in the last thing God told you. One of the things I learned years ago is that the last thing God told you will always be the first thing Satan tries to lie to you about. When God's word comes immediately and you obey, it says the enemy comes to try to steal and try to get that word, get that seed out of your heart. The last thing God told you to do, trust it. Obey him. Even if your situation gets worse, it's okay because when you do what God has told you to do, he's gonna help you every step of the way. Don't forget it was Jesus who told them to get into the boat. Fear always wants to question the last thing God said. Faith always wants to trust and obey the last thing God said. Have faith today. Trust the Lord. Whatever he's told you to do, obey it. Whatever he's asked you to do, and you're out there going, I don't think this is, don't doubt it. Keep trusting God. Keep obeying God. I'll give them credit. The disciples, the one thing they never did is they never tried to turn around and go back. They never did. They kept trying to go forward. Here's another thing that we need to know. Don't forget that Jesus met them out in the middle of the lake. A couple of weeks ago when a lot of things were getting crazy in our world, a couple months ago really now, Jesus spoke something to me as I was praying and having some devotional time. He said, Paul, remember the miracle a lot of times happens in the middle in the middle. And I said, what does that mean, Lord? And he said, go back and look at some of the miracles. It's when they were in the middle of the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not burn. And the son of God, like an angel, and was in there with them. It was in the middle of the Jordan River that when they got in it, the waters parted. It was in the middle of the lake that Jesus shows up to the disciples here. It's in the middle of the lake, in the middle of the night, that Peter begins to walk on top of the very thing that should be destroying him. It's in the middle. Sometimes you gotta get out into the middle of it before you can see the miracle of it. And Jesus is out there in the middle, and it's after hours of struggling and hours of fighting and hours of trying to get to the other side in the middle that Jesus shows up and is going to help them. And I want to encourage whoever's listening still to this. Don't lose hope in the middle. Don't lose hope in the middle. Don't go back. Don't give up. Don't quit because it's right there in the middle that Jesus might be getting ready to do the greatest work in your life. It's in the middle. It's in the middle. Second Samuel verse 22 excuse me, chapter 22, verse four, just listen to these words of David. He said, I called on the Lord and he saved me from my enemies. 
Listen to this description here. The waves of death overwhelmed me. Floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path. But in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I cried to my God for help. He heard me in his sanctuary and my cries reached his ears. In the middle, in the middle of all the pain and all the destruction and all the disturbance, God hears you. Don't lose sight. Don't forget Jesus when it feels like you're in the middle. Here's the last thing I'll leave you with. Don't forget that Jesus is trying to teach us something new or develop something new in this next storm. I find one of the most interesting things in this Matthew chapter 14 and Matthew chapter 8 is looking at what happens side by side from the first storm, storm to the second storm. It's really interesting how the disciples have actually grown and there's something even greater developed in them in the second storm. It says this, I just want to compare. It says in the first storm, remember, they followed Jesus and Jesus was in the boat with them. The second storm, they obeyed Jesus. Jesus wasn't in the boat with them. The first storm, the first storm, everybody stayed in the boat. But the second storm, Peter got out of the boat and actually walked on water. Peter knew if this is Jesus, it's probably safer for me to be out with Jesus in the middle of the storm than in the comfort of this boat with my friends. And he gets out of the boat. That never happened the first time. The first storm, Jesus asked, why are you so afraid? There was a spirit of fear. The second storm, Jesus said, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? The first storm, Jesus had to rebuke the weather. Remember, he rebuked it. The second storm in Matthew 14, Jesus gets into the boat. He never even addresses the weather and everything is calm. Here's my favorite part. I'll leave you with this right here. This is it. In the first storm, the disciples said, what kind of man is this? Who is this guy? Who is this? The second storm, they said, truly, you are the son of God. In the second storm, they had a deeper revelation of who Jesus is. And they connected with Jesus at a deeper level in the second storm than the first. With the second storm came a greater revelation of who Jesus is. And I know we hate storms. I know we don't like when our life gets disturbed. But I think with each storm, with each disturbance, I think Jesus is trying to give us a greater revelation of who he is and who he wants to be in your life. Most people don't want to go through storms. I get it. But sometimes it's in the middle of the storm that we see Jesus for who he is. I want to pray for you. I know some of you been going through some storms lately. Some of you, maybe you're feeling good, but I really feel there's a warning. Are you ready for the next storm? When the next storm hits, will you be ready? Last couple of months have blindsided us. A lot of people weren't ready for some of the things we faced. Let's not be blindsided by the storms that are coming. God's trying to prepare us. The first storm should prepare us and position us so that we would be ready for the next one. I wanna pray for you. Heavenly Father, Thank you for this word, for every person listening. I pray right now that your peace would pierce through the storms they're facing. Pray, Lord, that you would bring calm, just like you spoke to the winds and the waves, to their lives. Lord, I pray right now that you would help those who are agitated and they're disturbed. Their life is not easy right now because they're going through a storm. Lord, I pray against, Lord, the enemy trying to cause destruction in their life. I pray, Lord, like Jonah with the storm of correction, that, Lord, if there's something we need to repent of, if there's something we need to get back on track, Lord, I pray that you would help us. I pray for those who have been trying to run away from you to come back to you. I pray, Lord, 
for the storms of perfection that, Lord, if we're going through something, help us to count it all joy and to learn and to grow and to see you in the middle of the storm in a greater way. Help us, Lord. Help us to go and to walk and to, to, to continue to trust you even through the storms of life. And if you're here and you're listening to these words still, maybe like Jonah, you've been running from God. Maybe you really haven't surrendered your life to the Lord. Part of the storms that are coming in your life are because you keep disobeying God and you refuse to surrender to him. I wanna pray for you. I ask every week for our church family. Every week we say this prayer and we ask for people to say this with us. And if that's you, if you've been running from Jesus, if you've never given your life to the Lord, if you have never surrendered your heart to Jesus, the Bible tells us that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, not to condemn us, but to save us. And if we will confess our sins, and we will call out on the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. I wanna pray for you. Simple prayer. You can say this right where you're at, but repeat these words with me wherever you're listening to this right now. Say it out loud wherever you're at. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Jesus, come into my life. I surrender everything to you. I repent of my sin and I come back to you. From this day on, you can have all of me. I give you every part of my life. Help me to walk with you and to live for you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.